Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at the most common ways in which an electronic circuit can be built to measure temperature. I want to have a look at the most common temperature sensors and how they work, but also look at what is the extra circuitry needed to ensure a correct measurement. The three sensor types that I will be looking at today are the thermocoupled, the NTC and the RTD. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Let's start off with the most common type of temperature sensor used in circuits today, the NTC or negative temperature coefficient thermistor. Now negative temperature coefficient simply means that its resistance value will decrease with an increase in temperature, but there's a bit more to a sensor than just varying its parameters. Now an NTC is a variable resistor, so its resistance value will vary with temperature. So what I got here is a 10 kilo ohm NTC, so it has 10 kilo ohms at 25 degrees Celsius, so right now it's a bit colder, so its value is a bit larger than 10 kilo ohms, and we can see how its value will vary when we change its temperature. So if I increase the temperature using a hot air gun set to 150 degrees Celsius, we can see we have a very dramatic drop in resistance value, so this NTC will go down to about 200 ohms at plus 150 degrees Celsius, but we can also see how its resistance varies at low temperatures by using some cold spray. So if we spray the NTC, we can see again a dramatic rise in resistance. So this NTC will go to about 300 kilo ohms when it reaches minus 40 degrees Celsius. So even though NTCs have quite a small operating temperature range, so commonly minus 40 degrees Celsius up until 150 or 250 degrees Celsius, they will have a huge variation in their value. And because the value variation is so wide, normally you don't really need to amplify the signal coming from an NTC. So commonly a basic series resistor with the NTC can be used and the value coming from this resistor divider converted using an analog to digital converter. And from there on processing it to figure out exactly what temperature value you're measuring. Now of course you can use far more complicated circuits than this, but in most NTC applications, this sort of circuitry will be sufficient. But because of this arrangement, one of the problems that you can run into is caused by the fact that the current through the NTC is not very well controlled. So the NTC, after all, is a resistor, so any current passing through it will heat it up, and because the NTC value varies so widely, compensating for the self-heating can be quite difficult. And one approach that can be used to somehow mitigate this excess dissipated power is to use a switch in series with the supply, so to only power the NTC for very short periods of time, time needed to perform the measurement, and then to power it off. This way the NTC will not heat up and you will get a far more accurate measurement of the temperature around the NTC. Another thing to keep in mind when performing temperature measurements with an NTC is the rate at which its value varies. Now its response is not at all linear, but rather exponential, and if you want to be really accurate, then the exponential equation becomes really really complicated, so a good way to express how the NTC will vary its resistance with temperature is by using the steinhardt hart equation. And if you want to go the other way around, so to extract the temperature knowing the resistance value, you have this other thing, so you need to perform a bit of mathematics to convert the measured resistance value to a temperature value. So it's not a very simple transformation if you want to be accurate. Now moving on, the next sensor to look at is the RTD, or resistance temperature detector thermistor. Now this is also a temperature dependent resistor, but this thing is built from conductors rather than semiconductors, so its resistance increases with temperature. So this is a positive temperature coefficient thermistor. So if we try such a sensor out, so what I have here is a PT100 RTD connected to the ohmmeter, so right now it has 110 ohms. If we heat it up using the soldering iron, so taking it to about 400 degrees Celsius, we can see that its resistance is increasing. But we can already see that compared to the NTC, the resistance variation is very small. So by increasing its temperature by about 400 degrees, 
we only got about an extra 100, 100 something ohms. So even though an RTD has a much wider operating temperature range compared to an NTC, so RTDs can go from minus 240 degrees Celsius up until around 650 degrees Celsius, their resistance variation will be very small. So just a few percent every 10 degrees Celsius. So because of this, some sort of amplification will be needed to make accurate measurements. So commonly, an instrumentation amplifier will be used, coupled with the RTD placed into a Wheatstone bridge assembly. And after amplification, the signal can be passed on to an ADC to digitize the value. Now, regardless of the complexity of the measurement circuit, the RTD is a far more linear device compared to an NTC. So if we have a look in this application note from TE connectivity, we can see that based on the material from which the RTD is made, you can have either a fairly straight variation like with copper, or you can have a slight curvature with nickel or platinum. So you don't have a perfectly linear variation, but regardless, it's far more linear than the NTC. Now, the important thing about the RTD is its accuracy and its precision. So compared to the other two methods that we will be looking at today, the RTD is considered the most accurate and precise temperature measurement method. So the common accuracy grades listed for your platinum RTD, so this is the most common type of RTD, range from the 0.5% down to 0.06%. So this is a completely different ball game compared to the 3 or 5% of an NTC. But the RTD is only accurate if you can measure it precisely. There are two issues with the RTD's precision. First of all, you have the self-heating. Again, this is a resistor, so when the current is used to measure its value, the current is running through the sensor and it will heat up. But this is not as bad as with the NTC, since the RTD already has a small resistance value and the value varies much, much less. So the self-heating can be more easily accounted for. But the second issue with its precision has to do with the leads and the wires between the sensor and the measurement equipment. Since we're interested in measuring variations of only a few milliohms, any extra resistance brought on by the wires, especially when the sensor is far away from the measuring electronics, will generate considerable errors. Now, I found two interesting ways in which this error can be accounted for. And first off is the four wire measurement procedure. So you can measure a resistor, whether it's an RTD or otherwise, using the four wire measurement technique in which you inject a known current through the RTD through one set of wires and measure the voltage drop through another set of wires. The advantage of doing this is that the current that you inject will create a voltage drop on the wires, but the voltage measurement is done directly on the RTD, and since the voltmeter is a high impedance device, you will get negligible voltage drop on the measurement wires. So this way you will only be measuring the voltage drop on the unknown resistor and not on the measurement wires. But the problem with this approach other than its complexity, is that you need four wires to perform the measurement. And especially if you have a long distance in between your measurement equipment and the unknown resistor, this is going to add cost and it's going to make the harness very bulky. The second method involves using a bridge measurement, but using only three wires. So these two circuits are equivalent. On one side, we can clearly see the bridge measurement. So we have the RTD on one branch of the bridge, and then we have these other three fixed value resistors, and we're performing the measurement in between the two branches of the bridge. But in the second drawing, we can see how the RTD is connected to the actual circuit. So we're using two of these wires to connect the RTD to the bridge, and we can clearly see that one wire is in series with the RTD on one bridge, whereas the other wire is in series with R2 on another branch of the bridge. And then the bridge itself is connected to ground through the third wire. So the advantage of performing this sort of measurement is that this wire resistance is added both in series with the RTD and with R2, so the value cancels out. And well, we got an extra wire to supply the bridge, but that wire doesn't really matter. So this way we can perform an accurate measurement using only three wires. Final temperature measurement method to look at today 
is the thermocouple. Now this is basically made from two different metals fused together to form a junction and the device works on the Seebeck effect. If a temperature difference is created between the two ends of the thermocouple, so one end being the open wires and the other end being the junction, this will lead to a voltage developing between the wires and this voltage is dependent on the temperature difference between the two ends. Now if you buy a multimeter that has a temperature measurement function, you will also commonly get a K-type thermocouple with it. And you can use the temperature measurement function to measure temperature, or you can set the multimeter into voltage mode to see exactly what voltage the thermocouple is generating. So right now it's not generating anything because it's at the same temperature as the multimeter, but if we heat it up, so using my soldering iron, we can see a small voltage being generated. So you should be able to get around 16 millivolts for 400 degrees Celsius of temperature difference. And we're getting a bit less. But of course the thermocouple will work the other way around. So if we cool it down, we start to get negative voltages. So we have a positive temperature coefficient, but this time in voltage generation rather than in resistance variation. The thermocouple has some major advantages over the previous measurement methods we looked at. First of all, the temperature range is much wider. So based on the materials from which the sensor is made, it can work in temperature ranges spanning from minus 210 degrees Celsius up to 2760 degrees Celsius. So you can use this thing to measure even ovens. Another major advantage is that it's a voltage source. So it's not a thermistor. And the important thing here is that it will not self-heat. So as long as you're making a high impedance measurement, there will be almost no current flowing through the sensor, so no extra heat. But with all these advantages, of course you will get some disadvantages. First of all is the operating principle. A thermocouple is a relative temperature measurement method, not an absolute one like the ones we looked at previously. So what this means is that the thermocouple will give you a voltage proportional to the temperature difference between its hot and cold ends. So if we have a thermocouple whose junction is at 50 degrees Celsius and the measurement equipment is at 0 degrees Celsius and we have another thermocouple made from the same materials where the junction is at 100 degrees Celsius and the meter at 50 degrees Celsius, in both cases the temperature difference between hot and cold ends is the same. 50 degrees, so both of these setups will give us the same voltage value. Therefore to perform an accurate measurement using a thermocouple, you need to do a secondary temperature measurement which is so called a cold junction compensation measurement. So you need a second temperature measurement method to measure the temperature of your meter and then add this to the temperature difference which your thermocouple is giving. And this way you can get the actual value at the hot end of the thermocouple. And the other thing to consider about the thermocouple is the actual voltage that you will be getting from it, which is quite small. So we've already seen this in our experiment when I tried out a thermocouple, but we can get a far more accurate value if we study a datasheet. So what I have here is a K-type thermocouple datasheet where the voltage generated by the thermocouple is expressed in millivolts when its reference junction is at zero degrees and while the other end is at some other temperature. So you can see that this thermocouple will go from minus 6.458 millivolts at minus 270 degrees up to about 50 something, 55 millivolts at 1370 degrees. So you're barely getting about 35 microvolts per degree of variation. And well, this variation isn't constant, so the probe doesn't have a perfectly linear response. But regardless, because the value is so small, you will almost always definitely need some sort of amplification to actually measure this value. And considering the small value that you're trying to measure, the amplifier should have quite low noise and quite low offset to not interfere with the tiny values that you're trying to measure. And only afterwards you can convert this using an ADC. So direct conversion of such tiny values is usually not really practical. 
Now, there are of course other methods to measure temperature, but these three are the most widely used. Depending on the accuracy needed, the price and the complexity, and of course the exact temperature range of interest, one or another measurement method will be more suited. It all depends on your exact use case. And with that said, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.